He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. All I want to do is get someone to come up and tell me I do know where she is and get lucky and find that she's, he's right or she's right, you know what I mean? Bob Martin has been looking for his daughter, Francesca, for nearly 13 years. Fran, as he called her, was 42 years old when she was last seen at a petrol station in Hamilton on April 20, 2005. It appears she was asking for directions. Her car was found the next day, about 150 kilometers south, in the small town of Wairake, where state highways 1 and 5 meet about 10 kilometers north of Topo, the opposite way she had been planning to go. Her car was unlocked and Fran was nowhere to be found. It's a nearly two hour journey from Hamilton, a journey Bob has done more than 100 times to try to find his daughter. He spent all his savings in his search. Well, I'm hoping that someone will find something like a tree falling over and, and there's a sign that there's been a body there or something like that, you know. That, um, you see, all I want is my daughter and to bury her. Nothing more? I'd like to know who did it, but that's the second priority. Bob is convinced Fran was murdered, but years later, her disappearance remains a mystery. Why was Fran's car in Wairake? Did she go there? And if she did, did she go willingly? Or was someone else involved? I'm Paloma Migoni, and this is the fifth episode of The Lost, a podcast looking to what might have happened in some of the country's most mysterious missing persons cases and talking to the families about the void left behind. Those are all my roses, and that's my prize rose. This is a better one, but it's bright, it's dark red. Bob Martin is 79 years old, but he's quite an active man. At his home in Hamilton, he shows me his garden, roses, tomatoes. He also tells me he goes for a run every morning before breakfast. (laughs) How long do you run for? Now, it's only about um, about half an hour, three quarters of an hour by the time I I do do, do a short uh, jog, then I walk, then I sprint, uh, and then I do another jog, then I walk, and then I sprint all the way up here. (laughs) How many k's is that? Bob used to run five kilometres. It's now closer to two. He says running keeps him sane. It also keeps him fit. Being fit is important to Bob. He's on a mission. Well, he's been on a mission to find Fran. In the first 18 months after she went missing in 2005, he drove from Hamilton to Wairake 62 times. He used to keep track of the number of journeys. He since lost count. But he can't afford to keep doing the trips anymore. Petrol is too dear. After six years of searching for Fran full-time, Bob has spent all his savings. $75,000. He lives on the pension now. You can't go down there without eating. When when they found the body, uh, like something popped up over in um, Warrensville. I can't remember what it was. And I went over there to check out that it wasn't Fran. And a body turned up in Auckland at the back of a big cafe. And not much publicity was about what type of body it was other than it was a girl, you see. And so I rang the police up there and... Um, I had big telephone bills, just a bit here and a bit there, but a bit here and a bit there over six years, a lot of money. Fran was one of five children, three girls and two boys. But tragedy had first struck the family years ago. Her two sisters died in infancy, one at birth and the other at 10 weeks. Fran was the oldest of the living, a shy woman, but Bob says not too shy that she wouldn't tell you if you were doing something wrong. She had a quick mind, a knack for remembering numbers. She was a tiny girl, smaller than you, and 
She wanted to be bigger and she, she had uh, ambitions, and, but she wasn't forceful. Just a lovely nature. It's, um, she had a photographic memory, you know. She, she was like a mum. My wife and her could remember anything, you know. Sometimes I used to forget my TAB number, you know, when I used to bet, and my daughter would r rattle it off. How the hell did she know my number? <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't surprising when Fran told her dad she wanted to be an accountant. But Bob says her school didn't have an accountancy course. At 15, in 1978, she got an interview with the New Zealand Cooperative Dairy Company Association, now part of Fonterra. Fran went in for the interview, you see, and the first thing he did was he walked into the room and he spoke to the other girl in the room, you see, and gave her a whole set of numbers and uh, a name. And he said, don't forget that, and walked out. Then he came back in a hurry, walked in the door, and he says, what was that number? To the girl? And the girl couldn't remember. She just meant, oh, I've got it written down here somewhere, and she daughter prattled it off. He immediately came out and he says, the dairy company, the dairy company would like to take her on and pay her to go to tech and she'll be on full wages. You know what? He was so proud telling that story. In 1985, something happened to Fran, though, that would change the course of her life. She had an accident. As a devout Christian, she was a member of the Elam Pentecostal Church. Fran had been driving home from church on a scooter when she collided with a car. She was sent flying headfirst into a shop door. After some time in hospital, she recovered. But she was put on medications because of a head injury and stayed on them. She did have a problem at times that she'd hear voices. It, it wasn't anything, but it did worry her a bit, you know. Fran was then diagnosed as a schizophrenic. She was on antidepressants. Bob says it took time to find the right medication that suited her, but she was eventually OK. But anyway, after the accident, there came a time that she just said to the people at the dairy company, look, I can't cooperate as much as I should, and so she left. They didn't want her to leave, but she left anyway, and she started working for um, a group of solicitors. Bob still lives in the one-bedroom unit he was in when Fran went missing. She would often check on him, especially after her mum, Margaret, died in 2001. On the Tuesday before she disappeared, it was no different. Bob says Fran stopped by and said she was planning to spend a couple nights at a beach north of Raglan. Bob doesn't remember exactly which one. A couple of days later, he got a call. It was his daughter-in-law, Mary. She had a message from a police officer for him. Bob went over and called the officer back. It was the police and Tapa said, oh, we've just discovered a car that's registered to your daughter and it's got her daughter's purse inside and so forth and um, we think there might be something amiss. Fran's white Nissan Pulsar was found in Wairake. That didn't make sense. Fran was planning to go to a beach by Raglan. Wairake is south. What was the car doing there? We knew something was wrong, something had happened, you know, because... Um, it, I, I could feel that it wasn't good, you know. But I um, was determined to find her, you know. And we all went down there and we searched and searched and searched. And then they got in the um, search and rescue people, you know. And they had dogs and they, they went through it all. Then they got a helicopter that had a heat sensor on it and they went over that and still never found anything. But before leaving for Warake, the family had gone to Fran's flat. What they found there just added more to the puzzle. She'd left the lights on in the house. She had her washing in the washing machine and another set of washing in a basket ready to be hung out. And 
In the front room, there was a um, sleeping bag lying across the um, couch. On top of her bed was her uh, change of clothes to go over to the beach. And her medication was on the bed, and it was up to date. Bob says the flat was left as if she had gone somewhere quickly and planned to come back. She didn't. As the days went by, a clearer picture of Fran's last whereabouts began to emerge. The police found out she had visited a Caltex petrol station on Naylor Street in Hamilton on Wednesday, April 20th. There's CCTV footage of her visit, which you can see on our website. The footage shows Fran wearing a dark colored jersey and slacks. She was visiting the petrol station at 8.55 in the evening. You can see her white car through the window. She bought a packet of cigarettes and withdrew $30. And she spoke to the bloke. Then she walked out to her car. There's a dark van blocking the view of her car, so it's not clear if she spoke to anyone on her way out. But about 20 seconds later, she comes back in the shop and appears to be asking for directions, pointing outside. She then leaves the shop again. You can see her driving off about 10 seconds later, but not which way she goes. Was Fran asking for directions? If so, to where? Was it for herself or someone else? To Bob, the footage confirms she was planning to go back home. His theory is someone may have stopped her and asked for help. In our minds, we thought she was talking to someone outside the garage door, which didn't come into the camera focus, you know. And um, next thing is, nobody knew anything about it, except about an hour and ten minutes later or something, the car turned up at Wairaki. Bob is talking about a truck driver seeing a car like Franz later in the evening. We'll get to that in a bit. But first, remember the CCTV footage had a timestamp of 8.55 in the evening? The police told media at the time, this is when Fran was last seen at the station. When I spoke to the police officer looking after her case now, Detective Senior Sergeant Matt Cranshaw, he says bank records show Fran took out the money at exactly 7.57. The timeline is an hour out. This hasn't been reported before. Matt says this discrepancy could be because of daylight saving. Okay, so let's go back to the sighting. A truck driver says he saw a car like Franz around Wairake about half past 10, quarter to 11. With the old timeline, this makes sense. She left the petrol station about 9 and made her way down State Highway 1. The timings fit. The new timeline changes things. If she left the petrol station around 8, what was she doing for that extra hour? Media reports at the time said the truck driver saw two people inside the car. But Matt says the truck driver didn't exactly say that. He said that a vehicle like hers passed him as he headed towards the intersection of State 1 and 5 at Wairaki, about a few, three minutes um, north of Wairaki, to be fair. The truck driver then approached the intersection of State 5 and 1 and looked up State 5 towards Rotorua and saw uh, what he believes is the same vehicle, about 100 metres towards Rotorua. Uh, with the inside light turned on and the passenger door was opened. Um, From that, he uh, assumed it may have been two people because that door was open. However, could not see uh, inside um, the vehicle. On Thursday night, about 24 hours later, a police officer spotted the car. It was unlocked. Fran's car keys and wallet were found in the front seat. It was untidy. There were two rubbish bags, a book on how to quit smoking, and a bag of coffee had spilt on the back seat. The police officer called it in. The search for Fran continued for weeks. The police initially thought perhaps someone else had taken her card to Wairake and dumped it there. 
Could Fran have walked away? Bob doesn't think so. It came to mind for a second, he says, but not since. Her pills were up to date. He says she was on them. I would later speak to one of Fran's friends, Jackie Overdevest. She told me Fran did try to go off her pills before, to see if she could do without them, but then went back on them with help. When Fran went missing, Jackie says she never thought she went off on her own. Bob says police told him Fran could be anywhere between Hamilton and Topo. He searched the reserves along the way. I suggest driving down there together. So I turn left here? I turn left here, yep. But uh, in between times, Dave and I, that's my son, we went down and searched all, all the reserves that came up between uh, Hamilton and um, Topo, you know. And um, a lot of them, some of them are just south of Cambridge. What equipment did you bring? Just general equipment for um, when you go for a search, you know. So, um, Sometimes a rope in case we had to lower ourselves down a cliff or something like that, you know. When I had the tent, of course, I was carrying all the cooking equipment and everything, you know. Bob would camp at places he'd search. He would carry police posters of Fran through Putararu and Tokoroa and put them wherever he could. He says he would find old refrigerators at the reserves and open them to see if Fran could be inside. It didn't take long before they recognised me walking down the street because I was in all the papers and the Taupo paper was putting me in all the time, you know. And uh, so I had complete strangers coming up to me saying, uh, have you found her yet? No, you know. We eventually arrive in Wairake and Bob shows me where Fran's car was found. All right, maybe I'll just go in here. It was parked on State Highway 5 not far from the intersection with State Highway 1, facing Rotorua. Bob begins to tell me more about Fran's car. He says the police only tested the driver's seat and they didn't find any of her fingerprints on the steering wheel. He thinks this is strange. Bob also says the car had dog hairs. Fran didn't own a dog. Bob leads me to the Wairake Thermal Valley, about one kilometer from the main road, or what used to be State Highway 1, not far from where Fran's car was found. We end up at a cafe run by Kathy Sandbrook and John Richards. Hi, John. John, yeah. Hi, Paloma. Nice to meet The pair met Bob in 2005. It was one of those days when Bob was putting up posters of Fran. <laughs> Kathy, John, and Bob have been friends since then. Yeah. Well, well, we can eat something, can we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sitting outside the cafe, surrounded by animals, Kathy tells me she saw suspicious things happening around the area about the time Fran went missing. One night, she and John heard something. It was a scream. It was eerie and ear-piercing, she says. We were here, we'd been working, and we were heading, heading down to our accommodation, um, and... We'd heard a scream. Um, at the time, I'd thought it had come from the State Highway, what was then State Highway 1, um, and John had thought it had come from the uh, location sort of of his pussycat come to join us, um, of the Wairaki village. Um, and it was, just, it was one scream. It sounded distressing, like somebody in distress. Uh, we would have gone and investigated had there been a second scream, but we had thought it was approximately probably a, a, a kilometre and a half away um, and that the sound had travelled. Um, that was the first thing that we recalled. Kathy can't remember exactly what day it was, but she says it was during the school holidays, which in that year ran from April 15th to May 2nd. She says it must have been around 10 o'clock at night. Remember, Fran's white Nissan was found in the area on April 21st. Kathy also says she saw a red ute parked on the side of the road with a dog kennel at the back around the same time. It was about one kilometer down the road from the cafe. 
The road is surrounded by bush and is secluded. She was on her way to Topo. Again, it was late. I saw a man step out of the bush as I was driving. He stepped out of the bush on the right-hand side of the road. It was uh, just, he came out from behind a large tree. So that was um, quite a surprise to see him step out. And he had a shovel, he had a bushman's shirt. Kathy says the man had long red hair and was wearing gumboots. When she came back over an hour later, she saw the same ute, but there was a white car parked next to it. At another time, she also saw a dark green car, a four-door saloon type, again with a white car at the same spot. Kathy thought this was all strange, but at that point, she didn't know a woman was missing. So again, she can't really say whether it was before, on the day, or after Fran was last seen. It's not clear whether Kathy's observations are connected to Fran's disappearance at all, but she says she did share them with police. She wanted to share them again in case someone else saw something too. Maybe someone could shed some light on whether it means anything. Bob's search for Fran has mostly been focused at the bottom of the road that leads to the valley, where Kathy saw the suspicious activity. Why there? Well, to explain this, we need to step back for a bit. You see, shortly after Fran disappeared, Bob was contacted by psychics. Now, I know there are a lot of skeptics out there. I'm one myself. But this is Bob's story, and Bob says he has an open mind. They can be very persuasive, he says, and he took every avenue to find his daughter. He still would. He also says they never charged him any money for their services. Bob was first contacted by a Scottish dowser. Dowsers have used rods to find water for centuries. There's no proof it works. You may know them as water diviners. Bob doesn't remember the dowser's name, but the man told him he'd help him find his daughter. I used my car, and he said, don't take me to anywhere near where the car was or anything like that. He says, take me to the area above the lake in Taupo, where the helicopter lands and that. And so I drove him up there. Well, we drove him up there. He got out, his rods, there's the lake there, Pucker Falls down there, the rods point north, not water. And he had my daughter's slippers. And um, then he says, now drive back towards Hamilton, at the first street you come, it's going up to the left. Go up that for a while until I tell you to stop. The Scotsman eventually led Bob to that road, the one that leads to the Wairaki Thermal Valley, to a piece of land to the left. Bob sought permission to dig and search the area alongside police. Nothing was found. Two psychics, independent of each other, also sent Bob back to the valley. They both said Fran was killed. Naturally, I got very interested because it's right just across the driveway from where the Scotsman had the thing spinning. You see what I mean? And so I couldn't help but be a little bit interested in the psychic point of view, you see. One of them said Fran was buried on the other side of a fence on contact energy land. Bob again looked into getting permission to dig, and he dug. Businesses around the area offered to help. A bulldozing contractor worked for free. Again, nothing was found. That's why we're here, near the valley, where Bob has spent a lot of time searching for his daughter. He believes something sinister has happened to her. Someone else was involved in her going missing. I think she's been here, you know what I mean? And that where she is now, God knows. If these two that the first psychic saw 
They're big people, and if they had buried something and they knew people were going to bring in diggers and all that sort of thing, what's to stop them moving it anyway? That's Bob's view. So what do the police think? The police officer who led the initial investigation is Dave Beatty. Since it's more than 10 years since he worked the case, the police said it would be inappropriate for me to talk to him about Fran. Detective Senior Sergeant Matt Cranshaw took over the case about two years ago. I asked him what he thinks happened to Fran and whether her disappearance was ever treated as suspicious. Well, it was first investigated as a missing persons case. We still consider it a missing persons case. We're open minded as to what's happened to Fran. Obviously, we haven't um, found her. Uh, we've got no information at this point in time that would suggest that something sinister has occurred to her. Not to say that it hasn't, just that we haven't got the information to say uh, categorically that there's uh, more than two going missing. He says police are quite open to the possibility that she may have given a ride to someone and become a victim of foul play. Well, think about it. Why would she drive to Iraqi, leave her car on the side of the road, just to walk off? But Matt reminds me, Fren also had mental health issues. She had been in a mental health unit before. Well, there are some indications from some of her close associates that she was actually very unwell at the time. There was indications, or were indications, um, that she was to be assessed by mental health um, a couple of days post her going missing, and that she was concerned that she might be retained under mental health at that time. The truck driver sighting, seeing the light on, the passenger door open, that's not proof of foul play. What about Kathy's statement? She says she did speak to police. Matt tells me it's not on the file. He now plans to interview her about it. We'll go and speak to her when we can. Uh, it's been 12 years. We're not going to be rushing off here tomorrow to speak to her, but we'll make it an inquiry we can make in the next wee while. I ask Matt about Fran's car. Remember Bob says the police only tested the driver's seat? Matt says the inside and outside was fully tested, and he didn't see anything about dog hairs. We located discarded cigarette butts, half-eaten sandwich. Um, those items were analysed uh, by ESR. Um, they came back with the same female profile. Uh, because Fran disappeared, we haven't got a reference sample to compare with, with those items. But the deduction is that those cigarettes, butts and the, and the sandwich had uh, her DNA on them. You said that you don't have reference samples, so you don't have her DNA, you haven't actually compared it with her DNA? We haven't, she was never found, so we didn't have her DNA, no. So it's not 100% conclusive that those things all belong to her, the, the DNA found on those not things? Not conclusive, but they're, they're female um, profiles. Uh, she did buy a packet of cigarettes that matched the ones that were discarded um, that night at the service station in Hamilton. Um, I do watch, obviously, a lot of crime shows, Matt. So <laughs> what about, like, going and getting her, um, you know, toothbrush or something, you know, to get her DNA? Has that ever done? Uh, it's a reasonably complex um, legal sort of area. Uh, it's not as simple as, as that. And reading the file, even if it was, it wasn't done at the time, so we haven't got those, we haven't got that um, DNA. So the police can't be sure there wasn't another woman in the car. Matt says if a woman came forward saying she was in Fran's car, they would test her DNA. But why not check for sure whether it all belongs to Fran? Is it worth trying to get Fran's DNA? I mean, nowadays you can probably get her dad's DNA and kind of link it through that, can you? Oh, it's something we could explore. Um, that's something we could look at, I suppose. What about Fran's fingerprints? Remember Bob said they didn't find any of her fingerprints on the steering wheel? He suggests it was wiped clean. So we did lift some fingerprints um, from the car. However, that's uh, quite an old case and they were converted uh, into a system post this, this year. So I have asked, have asked um, to locate the results from that, those fingerprint tests and um, at the moment I can't tell you OK, because, again, he was saying that the steering wheel had no fingerprints except her oil. So you're not able to confirm that at all? 
Well, I had a look at the the testing done by ESR, and there's no there's no discussion at all about any oil taken from the steering wheel. So I'm not sure where that, that came from. But did they find fingerprints on the steering wheel? Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but I do not think so. Is that strange at all? Uh, you can't always get fingerprints from surfaces, surfaces you believe there'll be, uh, and you can't really make too much of that uh, other than there were no fingerprints there. So there are still some unanswered questions. The police searched Fran's house on April 23rd, but there was nothing suspicious, he says. But it was so early in the investigation, he's not sure whether they closely looked into someone else being there. They found out who owned the sleeping bag. And a couple of other people came to their attention, but it didn't take the police anywhere. In December 2005, Bob held a memorial service for Fran. This is the one for my daughter here. You can read it if you like. Okay. He says it's too difficult to read what he wrote for her and asks me to read it instead. With all the studies you and your mother did on the Bible and scriptures, anything in that line I might say would only be telling you what you already know. But you see, I know that your soul must be upset, lonely at present, because we haven't found your body, even though your brothers, me, and all the others have tried so hard. I'm so sorry that we haven't, dear. Well, even though that is the case, dear, we can't have your lovely spirit just drifting in the mist. He shows me drawings he made for Fran. Body, which he keeps happen. them in a folder at his house with all the other paperwork he's come across from the police investigation. So dear, with God's help, One of the drawings the features a number of angels holding today. hands, we are going to his wife through and three daughters, daughters Samantha, says, Kathleen, no and Francesca. Just total freedom of your soul. Enjoy the experience as your spirit flies up with the angels. I love you, dear. You'll always be remembered by me with pride while I live. Give your mother a hug for me. Look, dear, see, there's a band of angels. They are coming for you. They're coming to take you home. There's your mother, your two sisters, and my mother too, and a whole bunch of souls that in the past you knew. They are coming, Francie, to take you home. They are coming to take you home. God bless you. That's really lovely. I still get my days when I'm sitting here and, and I think about certain things and have tears running, but they're happy tears too, you know, because I think of the good times, you know. No, I don't know. I just feel that... Some, uh, something should have gone right instead of everything going wrong, you know. And that just didn't. Uh, I'm not a moron. I don't carry on um, being miserable or anything like that, you know. But um, I go out to my wife's grave and talk to her, you know. Bob says if Fran had simply walked away, she would have been found. It was definitely dirty work, he says. Bob hasn't been able to search for Fran the way he used to, but despite his age, he's still determined to find her. He'd be out with a shovel if he could get down there, digging and digging until he does. It's just cruel. Life throws some kind of funny turns on people. It's hellish for anybody to lose a loved one, irrespective of how or why. It's just the way things go, eh? But I do want to find it. This podcast has been created and hosted by me, Paloma Migoni. Technical production by Phil Benj. The executive producer is Tim Walken. And a special thank you to Adam McCauley. You can see video and photos by Rebecca Parsons-King at rnz.co.nz. 
This was the last episode of The Lost, but if you want to hear more, check us out on iTunes, Spotify, our website, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any information about the cases you've heard on The Lost, please contact Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Again, that's 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening and take care.